Hola. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Canada. If you thought it was cold here this week, you should see what it's like at my home. <laughs> so it's nice to be here to be warm for a little bit. <laughs> How to make the most of online learning. I have a I'm sure when you think of online learning, some thoughts come to your mind. What do you think about? You think about online learning. What does it look like to you? Well, does it look like this? Ah, it didn't work. <laughs> Yeah, that's an unintentional kind of... <laughs> my video didn't go and my... Okay, they're going to fix it up in the booth. <laughs> so that is that typical of online learning for you? <laughs> there we go. That's not my... Uh... <laughs> there we go. Okay, we'll just pretend that the video is playing. Or, oops. Okay, video but no sound. <laughs> World's most boring lecture. Oh, come on. Okay, my clicker is not advancing my slides. <laughs> All right, we're stuck. So we're going to have to just pretend that these slides are advancing. There we go. Yay. Um, does it look like this? People taking notes with a pen and paper while looking at their computer screen, watching a teacher with their back to you, writing on a whiteboard. Does that look familiar? This, your typical boring learning management system with a choice of 42 courses each course with 15 modules, each module with 15 sections to do, and your course number one, module number one, section number two. Does it look like this? With the step-by-step -step progression through gaining attention, through expressing the learning objectives, to presenting the content all the way through to an online test with multiple choice questions. Does all that look familiar to you? Well, I've been in online learning for 35 years now. Hard to believe. It's hard for me to believe I'm still employed. I mean, you've seen my skills. <laughs> my learning looks like this. It does not look like those typical online courses. It's very different. And you might say, well, sure. <laughs> does it work? Well, here, right? I'm giving you a talk. Somebody has just said some very nice things about me in Spanish, which I did not completely understand, but I did hear the word Maximo, so... <laughs> I've given lectures all over the world, I've published articles. Most of what I know about online learning I learned myself. When I started there were no courses or programs on online learning. We invented it from scratch. So yeah, it works. So what's different about the way I've learned online and that horrible mess you just saw? Well, 
because everyone loves lists, I've reduced it to five major points. Just for convenience, it's not like these are the five holy points of online learning, but it's just a device for being able to talk about it. Hacking my traditional schooling, it's about what I want to do, it's about process, not content, it's about learning from experts, really. Finally, about finding my own voice. And I'm hoping in between those five, you can see your own point number six, point number seven, whatever. So, first of all, hacking my traditional schooling. This may surprise you. I was not a typical student in school. Indeed. Um, in grade five, I created my own newspaper, used a mimeograph machine, hand drew the pictures, because I didn't know much about phot phot photography. In my early teens, I did learn to develop my own photos. In high school, I defined my own projects that were different from the ones that the teachers assigned me. In grade 11, a group of us through the social sciences department in a revolution. We called ourselves the Movement for Autocratic Organization, MAO. In university, once again, I was working on student newspapers, and actually in university, I spent most of my time working on the university or the student newspaper, and a little bit of time attending classes. In graduate school, I organized protests against the government to support school funding. As a teacher, I would give assignments, which I hated to do, but I would allow students to give me their responses in any medium whatsoever. I even told them, if you can put your assignment on a cube, hand me in a cube. I didn't know what I would get. I got a little of everything. And as a researcher, which is what I've been doing for the last 21 years, I threw out the rule book on research, developed my own path. So I've done these things differently. And how did that happen? It, it, it worked out. Um, this is the second video. I'm almost afraid. <laughs> so I'll just pretend we're playing it. And the, the young woman speaking there to TED Talk um, basically defines hacking and she says, hackers are people who challenge and change the system to make it work differently, to make it work better. And that's the, the mindset that I've always had um, as a student and as a teacher and as a researcher. Okay, it works, but there's still no sound. <laughs> and now my thingy doesn't work again. Could you advance the slides one, please? And we'll see if that happens. Another example is an article. The reference is on the next slide. Uh, about the next generation of students generation of students. Downturn, says the article, has bred a whole generation of just try to stop me kids. Determined to get the knowledge they need for success, even if it comes from outside the traditional educational framework. Now, as teachers, I want you to think about that for a second. Your students who you have so much difficulty motivating to do anything in your class, as soon as they get out of your class, they go home, they get on the computer, they start learning things. Think about that. Because that's what's happening. Another example, something called EduPunk, dreamed up by a friend of mine called Jim Groom, and it's the idea of carefully planned orchestra of pre-arranged scripts and routines and content and presentation, but four people just getting together, 
can barely use the instruments they're playing, do not actually know how to sing, and yet still making music. Only in education. And you might be thinking, none of this can possibly work, and yet it does. Some people say, well, yeah, but look at you. You're special. And I think, yeah, nice. No. <laughs> they say, you can teach yourself. Right? You have the special ability that allows you to teach yourself. But most people can't do that. Most people need direction. To which I say, no. That's not true. Everybody can manage their own learning. And indeed, mostly everybody does once they get outside school. They teach themselves to drive. They teach themselves how to play video games. They learn how to, oh, I don't know, make food in the kitchen, buy groceries at the grocery store, all kinds of things. Um, they learn to speak before they even get to school. No, it's not only special people that can learn to create their own learning. And that's a very important point. So, as teachers, what do you value in your students? Questions to ask. Do you encourage creativity? Do you allow students to change the rules? Not just the easy rules, but the really important rules. Can students find their own resources instead of the ones that you're providing in class? Do you respect, and I mean really respect, your students' opinions, no matter which student is giving them? Do you model or demonstrate innovation and creativity in your classroom? Do you recognize in your classroom multiple points of view, multiple points, multiple perspectives, even on the points on which there can be no, dis no debate, no dispute? Do your students want to be like you? As you can probably gather from the leading questions that I'm asking, the answer should be yes, but I think maybe it might not be. And that's part of what I'm trying to speak to you about today. Okay, I just came up with this yesterday. I don't know if this is a good slogan. You can tell me. It takes just one key to open a door. And you can be that key if you want to be. All right audience feedback segment. Is that a good slogan or should I abandon it here? Good slogan? Abandon it here? The volumes of participation wafting through the room. All right. That's the warm-up. That's just hacking the traditional education system. What about, it's about what I want to do. Imagine telling your students that today's lesson will be whatever you want to do. It's an interesting problem because for many students, I don't mean video games. Um, I look back on my own experience even in college and university, uh, I personally was never actually interested in learning content. Uh, I know that there were things that teachers were trying to very hard to get me to remember. And that was never important to me. For me, and maybe I'm selfish, but for me, learning was always about whatever I wanted to do, what sort of things I wanted to do. Let, let me expand on that a little bit. Uh, I studied trigonometry, I think it was four times, same lessons. First time was in high school, I studied trigonometry, and it went in here and out here, and I forgot it the next day. I barely passed. Then I was in a computer science program, first year only. In college, I studied trigonometry. Then 
out, barely passed. I went to university and they said, you need remedial math. And one of the things you have to study is trigonometry. So I studied trigonometry yet again. In, out, barely passed. Get the picture? But on my own time, um, I had, had bought a computer. I had bought a copy of Fortran, or sorry, uh, Borland Turbo C, installed it. That's uh, for, if you don't know, that's a tool that allows you to write software programs. I wanted to build the ultimate Star Trek game. I still do. Some things never leave you. And one of the things I wanted to do in my ultimate Star Trek game is rotate a cube on the screen, just like the Borg. You know what I needed in order to learn how to rotate a cube on a screen? Trigonometry. <laughs> so I found my old trigonometry textbook. It was red. Open page of trigonometry, sat down, figured out the equations that I needed, coded the equations, and successfully rotated a cube on a computer screen. It's about what I wanted to do, not about what somebody wanted me to learn. Well, that was an experience that said a lot to me. It's an example I've used over the years. There was a, an educational philosophy by a guy called Seymour Papert, pictured there. He's the one in the picture, not the one drawing the picture. I think that's a turtle. Construction is basically the idea that you learn by creating things, by making things, by constructing things. Here's an example where students are learning robotics by learning how to program robots made out of Legos. It's interesting, you know, you, you take something like Legos, you put it in a pile in the middle of the floor, and you put your kids beside the pile of Legos and they start making things, just on their own. You don't even need to motivate them, they just do it. So Papert said, this sort of thing that people really like to do is also really helpful for helping people learn. So there's a whole philosophy behind the idea of making things in school. And I'm sure, I am sure that you have seen this um, in other presentations. Um, you know, there was someone speaking, I was speaking with her earlier about Minecraft. And Minecraft is a tool for making things. It's sort of like reverse Legos, digital reverse Legos. Now let's take that a step further. Now there's talk about applying this more broadly. Imagine asking a prospective student, not what do you want to major in, what subjects do you want to study, but rather what would you like to do? What would you like to be able to make? Some possible answers. This is from the, uh, the paper that I quote here. I would like to make a porcelain cup. I would like to make a cure for cancer. I would like to make someone feel less anxious and alone. I would like to make a computer game. I'd like to make a solution to homelessness in my town. All of the different answers that people might give. And you know, you sort of sit there and you think, well, the curriculum cannot possibly encompass all of that. And it's true. And it's funny, isn't it? We take a traditional curriculum and impose that instead of having people make the things that they want to make. It's funny. What do I do? Well, my job as a researcher, and actually every job that I've ever had, really is four kinds of making things. I make philosophy. Um, I make computer programs, I make educational programs, I'll talk about that in a little bit, and I make, make journalism, it's kind, kind of awkward, I make newspapers and articles and newsletters and things like that. 
my work focuses around on what I make, not what I know, um, you know, not my knowledge. And think about it. If I couldn't make a presentation to you, I probably wouldn't have been invited to speak, right? No matter how smart I was, if I couldn't actually do something with it, it wouldn't matter how much I knew. For me, my work, my learning, my research are inseparable from my making. And I think that's probably true, if you think about it, for most people. You know, what do you do in your life, your professional life and your personal life? Do you just sort of sit there and know things? This is me knowing things. <laughs> Enough knowing. Yesterday I made a collection of photographs from Madrid. Like I say, it's all the same thing to me. Taking photos, making a presentation, doing research, writing a computer program. It's all the same thing. Now while I'm talking here, I just want to give attention to and say thank you to the sign language interpreter whose work I very much appreciate as part of this presentation. Thank you. Now you're probably thinking, wait a second, you used to talk about online learning and we haven't had anything about online learning so far. And maybe you're beginning to feel a bit cheated. Well, you know, and I explained to the organizers, I could have come in here and started talking about artificial intelligence and blockchain, um, maybe a little robotics for fun, um, perhaps some federated communication systems probably wouldn't have been very relevant. But it wouldn't have been the main point anyways. All of this that I've been talking about so far is about online learning. And for me, the big change that happened when I went from traditional learning, even traditional learning that I was hacking all the time, to online learning is that all of these things, hacking, learning, making things, became much easier, much more possible. They became real, live, viable, viable possibilities for me. And in online learning, it's about what we can do online. It doesn't matter what we do. Take a picture, make a presentation, write a blog post, design a game. Sorry, that was a challenge for her. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, oh, right. if, if, if it's anything, then what is it? Oh, that's not how that slide should look. Hmm. Oh, I guess it is. I have another copy running on my computer here. <laughs> Just to check them to be sure. Okay. Oh yeah, that is how it's supposed to look. Never mind. Um, I also sometimes talk to myself. Sometimes in not the best situation. <laughs> okay. This is the third section of the talk. We're at 4.51. I've got 25 minutes to go. Unless I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, tell me. Because <laughs> all I've got here are zeros. <laughs> Um, okay, this is the most important part of the talk. The secret weapons for the online learner are logic and language. For those of you working in language or working in bilingual schools, that should be very welcome news. But it's true. And I'll explain what I mean. By logic, I mean four major areas of endeavor. Description, which might include talking about properties or relations of things or, or even values of things. Definition, maybe definite descriptions. 
maybe ostensive definitions, the domain of a definition. Arguments, which is convincing somebody that something is true. Maybe inductive arguments, deductive arguments, or the cornerstone of explanations, abductive arguments. And finally, explanation. These four things are at the core of all of logic. If you know how to do all these four things and do them at an advanced level, you have a secret weapon. Interesting, it's not on the curriculum. <laughs> well, math is on the curriculum. Oh, oh, it didn't advance. There we go. I'm sorry about that. So there are the four. Description, definition, argument, and explanation. Math is there in its proper place as part of logic. Then language, and you know, I mean, I could define language in various different ways. I did it this way. Syntax, not just, you know, general principles or rules of grammar, but any, anything that involves patterns, rules, similarities, generalizations, you know, finding the structure of things. Semantic, not just truth, although truth matters, but meaning, ability, relevance. Oops, too far, too fast. Too long. Use, how we apply things. What the utility of a thing is. Cases where knowledge is used. And then finally, context, the environment in which whatever it is we're doing takes place. These are the secret weapons. These, well, eight elements all together, and we can organize them and combine them differently. It doesn't matter how we organize them. These form the process, not the content. These are the secret weapons for the online learner. This is what helps them succeed as an online learner. And this is what they learn from learning online. I can spend the next year talking about that. Instead, I'll point you to something I did a few years ago. Um, called Speaking in Lol Cat, because when you think about these eight things, you'll find them everywhere, everywhere you look. If you go online, you know, you see memes online or TikTok dances. I won't dance, it's okay. Um, these are, these patterns, these secret weapons being used naturally by students, naturally by people, without being trained how to do them. It's funny. Um, a meme, like a, a, a law cat, for example, is a combination of a picture and some words organized in a special way. And there's a link there, how to speak law cat. It's a whole system of speaking that people developed on their own. And you can learn about it following that link. These are the tools, these eight things, of learning when the content does not matter. So if it doesn't matter what you want to do, these are the things that will help you do what you want to do. They're also the tools of science and research as well. They form the core of human cognitive processes. And I think we recognize that. I, I think that as teachers, we know how important these things are. Even though it's really hard to sit students in a room for eight hours and teach them about logic and argument and mathematics and writing and grammar and stuff like that. Wait a sec. Did I just say the content doesn't matter? I did. And I mean it. The content doesn't matter. Now, there's no small number of people out there saying, no, 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 no. You have to have content knowledge. 
you can't learn how to do anything without content knowledge. Well, <clears throat> you need some content. You need to, you know, if you're talking with a friend, you're going to be talking about something, not nothing. But it doesn't matter what you're talking about. You're still using the rules of language through rules of logic, etc. What's important here, and what we find, especially in today's digital world, is the content is changing all the time. You might think it's really important that your students learn about Borland Turbo C. It was key for me in learning how to program. But here I am today, how many of you ever heard of Borland Turbo C? One, two, three, four, five. Good for you guys. <laughs> You're old school. <laughs> For the rest of them, nobody learns Turbo C anymore. Pictured on my slide, how many of you recognize what that is? That is what I was taught was the planet Pluto. My favorite planet. Still a planet, dang it. It doesn't matter which content you're using. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about this subject area, that subject area, whether it's biochemistry or physics or how to cook a pot roast. It doesn't matter. The same secrets still apply. The structure, the patterns, the meaning, the value. Think about pot roast. You don't usually think about pot roast. It's a traditional Canadian dish. It's a lovely dish. You follow a recipe, you know, which is a list of operations or rules or methods, right? So if you're good at following rules or instructions or methods, you can actually successfully cook a pot roast without ever having done it before or even been shown how to do it. Um, it's also about values. Why would you want to cook a pot roast? When is it appropriate to cook a pot roast? Hint, probably on a Sunday, not on a hot summer day. Rules of logic and language still apply. And that is key to learning online. Online, instantly, when I was preparing these slides, and I prepared them in my hotel room yesterday, because I like to do things ahead of time, I learned how to, like normally you see Pluto, it's in space, and space is black. But then I would have had a big black square on my slide and it would have looked ugly. So I looked up how to remove the black and convert it to white. Looked it up, figured it out, actually did this in about 30 seconds. Now, it could have been taught in the classroom, I suppose. They could have done a full class session on changing your background, but I could learn it online in 30 seconds. When I came here today, I took a taxi. Yeah, I know, luxury. I got into the taxi. The driver asked me, where are you going? He asked me in Spanish. I didn't understand, but I figured that's what he was asking me. And I said, Esculia, uh, what was it, Esculia Scala? Am I close? Sorry? That's it. So, oh, right. Sweet so dad. Yes. So, anyhow, I said it, and he didn't understand me, so I showed him it. He took out his phone. He said into his phone, Sweet dad, let's go out. His phone gave him directions on where to find it and where to drop me off. And that's very different from driving a taxi even 10 years ago when you had to have a map in your head of where everything was. Now you don't need to know. You just ask your phone. Now people might say, well, yeah, but that means you don't know where everything is. Yeah, that's true. And what if your phone breaks? Well, if it breaks on your first day, you're in trouble. We admit that. 
But asking your phone to find places for a while, you begin to recognize where they are, and you don't need to look them up on the phone anymore. I mean, how many times do you have to look Prado up on your phone? You probably figure out where it is by now. You don't have to be taught. There's no class, where is Prado? You learn it by using the tool that helps you find out what it is in the course of doing something. And that's how we learn online. Very different. Let's <laughs> see, uh, again, another one of these things I'm trying. The pragmatic pièce de résistance. That's the token French for this session. Nobody cares about what you know. Trust me. They care about what you can do, what you can make. And to a less what you did, but mostly it's about what can you do now and in the future. So that brings us to experts. Learning from experts. And this is one of the big advantages of learning online is that we actually can learn from experts. It's a wonderful thing. But the problem is, and I know this, experts are terrible teachers. That's an expert teaching advanced physics. How fun does that look? They don't even speak the same language you do. And I'm not talking about English, French, or Spanish. I'm talking about, in this case, the advanced language of physics, tensors, vector spaces, etc. Language that, especially as a beginner, you don't know. But the expert doesn't know you don't know that. And he, even if he did, he wouldn't care. And worse, the expert probably doesn't want to teach you anyways. A physics professor became a physics professor because they wanted to do physics not because they wanted to teach. So experts are terrible teachers. Tony Bates says, well, we should teach all the university professors to be better teachers. Yeah, I'm not sure that's the best advice. So what are experts good for? Well, experts are models of best practice. In fact, whatever an expert does is by definition best practice, right? Most of their knowledge, though, cannot be found in a book. Michael Polanyi calls that tacit knowledge, or sometimes personal knowledge. And experts don't talk, mostly, to you and me. They talk to each other. They form what are called communities of practice. And you can look up Etienne Wenger and others about the concept of the community of practice. That's how they learn online. You know, a nuclear physicist doesn't go learn about advanced nuclear physicists in a classroom. They talk to other nuclear physicists in their communities. What digital technology and online learning allows us to do is to be a part of these communities of practice, or as they sometimes call them, distributed digital communities of practice. So, experts are models for learning, but they're not teaching, they're doing. Think about that. That's how experts learn. They might do labs or workshops, they might offer apprenticeships or internships. They might design simulations and games. They might take part, they generally take part, in real world projects. You know, um, trying to help the environment, trying to cure COVID, trying to prevent a nuclear reactor from melting down, trying to find out who the fastest person was to run a race. I mean, there are experts everywhere, all over the place, doing all kinds of things. It's not just, you know, advanced science. One of the great things about cable television in my country now is that we're learning that there are experts in every single discipline. Cooking, yes. Plumbing, yes. Woodworking, yes. 
experts everywhere. And this is how they teach each other. This is the model for us to know how to teach online, to teach digitally. Experts form their communities. They form a tight little community right in the center. Around them is a wider professional community. And they talk to the experts, and the experts talk to them. Outside that, in an even bigger community, are the students. Most students are just watching what's going on. They're watching the experts model their practice. They're watching the famous dart player play darts. And they're thinking to themselves, if they want to be a dart player, I want to learn to play darts. I'm going to do what Jockey Wilson does. Or Lionel Messi, or whoever, but they're following. Sorry, I had to throw a messy reference in there. Something I made with my friend George Siemens, it's about what you make, is a theory called connectivism. There are some references there that you can look at, but it's all about how people learn from each other in these online digital communities. Classes or courses, but communities. I also helped with the concept of personal learning environments. Now think about this as a concept. Think about yourself as the center of a learning network, all those experts and all those disciplines you're interested in, and you join those communities and you follow those communities, and that's how you begin to learn. You see the experts in your profession, whoever they are, you might not know who they are at first, modeling best practice in learning. And that's what George and I were trying to do. So another thing we made, we made a MOOC. Too far, there we go. A MOOC was a model of how communities make their own learning. So what we did is we made a learning environment, a digital learning environment, where people could talk to each other. It was massive. We had lots of people, thousands of people come join us. It was open to everyone, very important. It was all online. And we denied it was a course, it was an experience. Okay, no, we said it was a course, but... Mm -hmm. by Udacity and FutureLearn and others doing traditional learning online. And you see the traditional focus on content and on assessment and on things like behaviorist learning, cognitivist learning, even, even constructivist learning. But it's all about these formal classes, formal instruction, etc. Our MOOCs were completely different. Our MOOCs or content used open educational resources or even better stuff that was created by the people in the course. It was flexible and distributed. For assessment, we didn't do assessments because the idea was to tell people what you get out of the course is your assessment. If you think you got what out of the course what you wanted, then you passed. You, and you're sitting there thinking, oh, that's a stupid way of assessing people. Well, it's not about, for us, it was not about us assessing them. It was about them assessing themselves. And you might think, well, how can you responsibly have people assess themselves? Well, if somebody's trying to do something, assessment becomes easy. Either they were successful in doing it, or they were unsuccessful for some reason, they learn from that and try again. And you can tell, did they succeed or not? For a programmer, it's does the programming run and does it add two plus two and get four, not 17? If it gets 17, you did not succeed. What sort of model are you offering to your students? Are you offering a bridge 
through this community to an expert? Or are you posing as one? That's a hard question to ask a group of teachers, isn't it? Maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. This is another one of these slides. Maybe I should have run it. Maybe I shouldn't run it. But I think it's an important concept. Okay, audience feedback time. Use this slide again in the future. Yeah. Don't use it ever again. <laughs> yeah, a small nod on the yes side. Okay. Five, finding my own voice. The key to learning isn't about finding courses or lessons or videos or whatever. The key is to use all of these and anything else you can find to create your own learning, your own thing online. I have a theory about learning. Uh, it's a very simple theory. I call it Downs' theory of learning, which is funny because it's not really a theory and it's not invented by me. To teach is to model and demonstrate. That is, in fact, what the experts are doing. To learn is to practice and reflect. And our role as teachers is to somehow join these two things together. So it's not about us teaching courses, it's about us making connections. And that's what digital technology lets us do. How do we find that community? Or best of all, go out join a community. Look for existing communities, Facebook, Reddit, Meetup, Stack Overflow, wherever. How do you do that? Well, just ask a question of Google, be as specific as possible, like how do I fix a derailleur, not cycling, and you will find the community. You'll find the community by the length and then participate in the community. And you participate not by jumping in and being all expert on day one. No, you participate in I'm giving you a bit of a model. Read, share, ask, and then build. Follow what the community is doing, share what you're doing, then you can start asking for questions and advice, and then finally you can start building the community. Instead of offering digital lessons as instructors, as teachers, you should demonstrate how you learn about something on This works really well, especially if you're not very good at it. Show people the process. Model good learning. Model your use of those eight secrets. Still not sure? Look it up on Google. It'll tell Find a few things you like, then maybe blog about it. Don't know how to blog? Look that up on Google. I'm Stephen Downs, and I thank you very much for your kind attention.